Nobody ever gets my name right. That was very exciting. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Uh, so, hi folks, I'm Lisa Van Gelder. I was most recently VP Engineering at Meetup, but I left there at the end of September. I've been in tech for, ooh, about 20 years now. These are a few of the companies I worked at along the way. And there's one thing that they all have in common, and that is pretty soon after I get to a new place, someone from the lead team pulls me to one side and says, how do we instill a sense of urgency into the team? And really, the thing that they're asking me is, why is our pace of delivery so slow? That is, why is it taking so long to get new features shipped? Is there something wrong with the architecture? Is there something wrong with the tech stack? Is there something wrong with the engineers? Do they not know what they're doing? Do they not care about the important business priorities? And spoiler, it's usually not your team. There's usually something else going on. So what do we do when software is slow? We debug it, right? And I would say the same answer for if a team is slow. You figure out what is going on. So in this talk, I'm going to tell you stories about times when I debugged teams at two different companies. That is Barrexel Media and Meetup. And your first question is probably, uh, what the hell is Barrexel? Um, it's basically the biggest magazine publishing company that no one has ever heard of. They have 600 magazines, 100 TV and radio stations. In New York, they had titles like Life and Style, In Touch, Women's Weekly. And I was brought in to figure out what was wrong with the New York team. The New York team was really not engaged. The lead team told me they were coming in late, they were leaving early. There were literally times during the week where nobody knew where the engineers were or what they were doing. And they weren't answering Slack. Um, velocity was going down sprint by sprint. The lead team was tearing their hair out. So they brought me in basically asking me, is there something wrong with our engineers? Could we just replace them all? So I joined the company. I started debugging the team. Um, I shouted at engineers. I a ceremony and two. Oh, funny things happening with this. That's what you have with. Thank you. Um, I went to their stand-ups, I went to sprint planning, to grooming, to retros, and I realized pretty quickly that there was something interesting happening at sprint planning. The scrum master said he wanted to hold engineers accountable for getting their work done. It was frustrating to him. At the end of every sprint, there were a whole bunch of stories that hadn't been finished. So what he did was at the end of sprint planning, Every engineer had to sign up for which stories they personally would complete by the end of the sprint. And if they didn't finish any of them, they had to justify why they hadn't finished that story in front of the whole team and their manager. The engineers hated this. <laughs> they felt like they were being blamed for not getting their stories finished. And bear in mind, it often wasn't their fault. They could be blocked waiting on another engineer, or perhaps a different team, but they were told to push through it anyway. So what did they do? They started padding their estimates. Sprints went from Monday to Friday. By Thursday, most engineers had genuinely finished their work for the week, but they didn't want to admit that, because there was a risk they could be given a story that they couldn't finish by the Friday. So what did they do? They started hiding around the room. They hid around the building. They didn't answer Slack. So in other words, something that was intended to hold engineers accountable, getting more work done, had completely the opposite impact, and velocity completely tanked. So I've talked a bit about debugging teams. Um, this is the framework that I like to use. It comes from this book called Drive by Dan Pink. It's actually all about individual human motivation. It's not to do with teams. But I find it maps really well to team motivation. Usually, if a team is doing something kind of surprising or unexpected, it, like, it kind of maps to the lack of one or more of these things. And they are mastery. That is, are people in the right job? Do they have the skills they need to be successful? Is the path to promotion clear? Autonomy. How much control do, team ha do teams and individuals have over the work they do? Do they have problems, not solutions? 
purpose? Is it clear why teams are working on things? Can engineers draw a straight line from the stories that they're, they're working on to company strategy? And lastly, safety. This actually isn't from Drive, and this is something I added. This comes from Google's research into high-performing teams. Google did a ton of research into what makes some teams more successful than others. They looked at everything from personality types to different skill sets. And in the end, what it came down to for them was psychological safety. And that makes sense, right? And if you're not feeling safe, you're not going to take risks. If you're not feeling safe, you're not going to try stretch goals. If you're not feeling safe, you're kind of probably going to cover your arse. And ooh, doesn't that sound familiar from Baroxel? So I'm going to talk about how I applied this framework to Baroxel. But first, a note about measurement, because things like speed and pace of delivery are really subjective. And if you can't measure them, then how would you know if the changes that you are making are having a good impact? My preferred measurement for pace of delivery is cycle time, which is the time between an engineer starting to work on a story and the story being live in production. And I love it because there's nowhere to hide. If it takes an engineer three days to finish a story, but then it takes another week for it to get deployed, then ooh, there's a fun bottleneck to get to the bottom of. A lot of people like to use velocity to measure pace of delivery, but there's a problem. Velocity can be gamed. Many years ago, I had a stakeholder who was really unimpressed with how many points my team was getting done every sprint. We're getting 10 points done. So I said, no problem. And I told my team to times every estimate by 10. So a three-point story became a 30-point story. Overnight, my team was doing 100 points every sprint. Fantastic. Stakeholder was thrilled. Um, it was the same work. We just changed the measurement. Yay. Um, oh, also good news about cycle time. If you use things like Jira, Pivotal Tracker, it's already in your tool, so no extra tracking needed. Cool, so applying the framework to Bar Excel. First of all, Bar has a safety problem. The engineers were feeling blamed if they didn't get their stories done. And usually, if you have a safety problem, it's the first thing that you need to tackle, because if people are feeling unsafe, it's really hard to motivate them to do anything else. So we said, hey, that thing about signing up to doing stories, we're going we're gonna to forget that for now. We're going to switch instead to tracking team velocity rather than individual velocity. And that's supposed to get as many stories as you possibly can. If they're not finished, it's OK. And then I said, fantastic, team. Now we're going to start tracking cycle time. We're going to work out how to, how to reduce it. And my team said, mm, why does that matter? Like, honestly, why does it matter if we goof off a bit on Friday afternoons? So it turned out it mattered incredibly. Bauer was reliant on online advertising revenue. They required unpaid acquisition from Facebook, and Facebook had just changed their algorithm again, so it was much more expensive to acquire users. In fact, it was so bad that if we didn't pretty quickly figure out other ways of getting revenue and getting more eyeballs on our pieces again, the team was at risk. But nobody had told that to the team. They didn't want to worry them. So I sat down and had a really frank and kind of scary conversation with the team to be like, hi, uh, actually this stuff really does matter. I drew a straight line from the stories that we're working on to company revenue goals and what we all had to do to be safe. And now the team really got it. And they went from hiding around the, the, the building on Friday afternoons to, having, to, to being excited about new ideas and what the latest results were from the experiments. So now we could start looking at cycle time and how to track it. We looked at where some of the bottlenecks were in getting our stories through to production, and we found one pretty quickly. We weren't tracking individual velocity anymore, but there were still some people who were in charge of certain parts of the code base. The idea was that if only certain people worked on certain parts of the code base, they would be experts at that, right? It would be quicker for them to do it. They'd have good architecture patterns. The trouble was it became a bottleneck really quickly. What happens if a lot of changes have to happen in one part of the code base? Only one person can do them. What happens if that person gets sick, goes on vacation, or, God forbid, they leave? So we switched instead to the idea that any 
any person on the team could pick up the next story in the backlog, irrespective of if they were the expert on that area of the code or not. And I encouraged pairing. So if someone picked up a story and an area they weren't so familiar with, they would pair with someone else who knew it a lot better. This had another really great unintended side effect. Uh, back in the world of individual velocity, there was nothing encouraging seniors to pair with junior engineers. Because any time they took away from their own stories, oh, they might not get something done. But now, in this new world of team velocity, where we encourage pairing, now seniors are pairing with juniors. Juniors are learning. Uh, knowledge is being shared across the team to different teammates. In the short term, oh, velocity went down. But in the long term, it had dramatic impact both on velocity and on cycle time. I talked about juniors and seniors at Bauer Excel, but that was actually a pain point. And when I got to Bauer, there wasn't a skills matrix or engineering ladder. That was, there was no definition of what it meant to be a junior or a senior engineer there. And that meant that there were some people with the senior title who had less than a year's programming experience or had just graduated from a boot camp. There were people making some pretty big architecture decisions who just didn't have the experience to do that. Ah, the result, some changes that should have been really simple to do and taken days or weeks took months. And it was also very demotivational for the team. Uh, if you're a senior engineer with 10 years experience, to watch someone come in with a fraction of your years and expertise but get the same title and salary, ooh, that's not great. And it also wasn't great for the junior engineers. There was no clear career path for them. There was nothing explaining to them what skills they needed to learn, so like, hey, like, why should they bother pairing with people? Why should they try to improve their skill set if getting that new title was actually just based on how well you interviewed when you first came to the company? I knew going in that I was going to need to level the team, that is, take a long, hard look at their titles compared to their skills and seniority. I put it off for as long as I could because, hey, like stressing about changing your title or your salary, um, that messes with safety. <laughs> And when people who feel unsafe, it's hard to motivate them by anything else. But then we had oh, yet another project which was really overdue because of how overcomplicated the architecture was. And I knew that I had to address it. At that point, though, luckily, I'd already bought some trust with the team by, by um, increasing velocity and changing cycle time. So when I brought up another big change, at least I had some trust going into it. I introduced a skills matrix to the team. So we set down really clearly, this is actually the real skills matrix from, from Bauer Excel in its original spreadsheet glory. Uh, we set out very clearly for every level of engineer from junior all the way up to engineering director, like what, what are the skills and experience necessary at every level? And it's not just programming. There's also things like communication, collaboration, mentoring. It's hugely important to me that senior engineers will mentor juniors coming in. So we introduced a skills matrix, and I leveled the team. Titles changed, salaries changed, some people left. But for the people who stayed, they were grateful. The seniors were grateful because they finally had real recognition of their senior status. And the juniors were grateful because they had a clear path to career progression. We can now sit them down and tell them exactly what they were doing at their level, what they needed to do to get to the next level. I've talked a bit about some of the changes I introduced. I'm going to take a step back now and talk a bit about the change toolkit, about how we introduce some of these changes, because some of them are pretty big. First of all, change is really scary if it's done to you, as opposed to you feeling like you are part of the change. So as much as possible, I try to give engineers the power to control the change. Um, an example would be the skills matrix. When you introduced the skills matrix at Bar Excel, every engineer got a chance to define the levels. Everyone got a chance to actually define their own level before it was used to level them as part of the leveling process. The engineers also controlled the timeline. They told me that they wanted a grace period of a quarter. So if someone was leveled as a bit below their genuine experience level, they'd have a quarter to work with their manager on getting the skills necessary to keep their title. It didn't work for anybody, but people at least felt a bit more control over the process. 
Kaizens are another way to try to give teams control over the changes that happened. Uh, Kaizens are small experiments that lead to continual improvement. It comes from the Toyota way. The idea behind Kaizens is that rather than tell people, like, these are the three things that you will do to change cycle time, instead I gave them an overall goal, which was actually pretty ambitious. I said we were going to decrease cycle time by at least 50% over the next six months. And the Kaizen is like a small step on the way to that. So like 50% is a huge goal. So over the next sprint, like, hey, what small things can you do over the next sprint to decrease cycle time by, hey, maybe 5%. And over time, each of those small steps add up to something bigger. So you have a hypothesis about the thing you're going to change. You change it. If it worked, fantastic. We run to the next thing. If it didn't, can you tweak it to get to the next step? Uh, an example of one of the Kaizens that we did was changing the PR review process. So rather than waiting, rather than waiting until engineers had finished their story um, to review someone else's PR, because it was much more important to get a PR all the way through to production, and instead people should interrupt their work to get their PR done. A few of those different things added up to some quite big improvements. Next, Nemawashi. That is the informal process of quietly laying the foundation for some proposed change or project by talking to the people concerned. Or in other words, I never go into a big change cold. Before introducing a big change, I'll always talk to like, the stakeholders, the key influences on a team, whoever that might be. So by the time I introduce the change to the, to the wider team overall, I know I have, I have like, most people on my side. An example of that, at the same time as introducing the skills matrix, also introduced a performance review process to Bauer for the first time. So people were reassured that their skills would be measured continuously rather than just once and then forgotten about. So we had performance reviews, introduced smart goals, and introduced them first to the team cynic, that is the person who hated performance reviews and said that smart goals were completely pointless. He was one of the seniors who was unintentionally one of the biggest bottlenecks on the team because he was so excited about helping other people with their problems that he would solve a lot of problems for other people, never really had time to focus on his own code. So I set, I set smart goals with him that were all about knowledge sharing, about teaching other people like how to debug and how to solve issues rather than solving everything for himself. And he was delighted. So when the time came to introduce smart goals to the rest of the team, uh, that, that cynic spoke up and said, hey, I did this, actually. It was great. And that really helped introduce it to the rest of the team. Change is most effective if people are honest with me about what works. So as much as possible, I tell people that the worst thing you can do is not tell me if you think I'm doing something wrong. And I encourage people to come talk to me in any way that works from one-on-ones to emails to anonymous surveys. And if people are open to it, when someone gives me hard feedback, I'll publicly thank the person who did that in front of the whole team and say what I learned, what I'll do differently next time. Similarly, uh, I'm going to mess up. Everybody does, right? People take their cues from leaders for how they behave when they mess up. So when I do, again, I'll get up in front of the whole team, say what I did and what I learned. I've introduced something called a toast to failures at one of the companies, where, well, fairly regularly, at the all-hands meeting, everyone would, would get up and talk about something that they messed up recently and what they learned, and I would be the first one up there, showing the way. So, end result. We end, end, ended individual velocity. We ended individual assignment of stories. We introduced a skills matrix. We introduced pairing. Uh, cycle time, the time between an engineer starting to work on a story and it being live in production, went from 14 days to 1.5. The lead team was, was excited. The team was happy. I was happy. But around about this time, I met a friend of mine in a bar. She told me about another company that was having challenges. And those challenges sounded kind of fun. I liked some of the people there. So I moved to Meetup. And moving to Meetup, Meetup had a couple of pretty similar challenges, actually, to Bar Excel. They wanted to introduce a sense of urgency to the team. They said that the, the engineers didn't want to ship. They felt they had to force engineers to ship. 
there's also a really big quality problem. Um, every time the team shipped, there were a whole bunch of bugs that went out to production. And engineers just weren't fixing the bugs. Meetup had bug birthdays. Some bugs were live in production for more than a year. So I, I joined, joined Meetup. I started debugging the teams. And my first question was, how do you decide when a release is good enough quality to go out to the world? And they said, ah, let me tell you about the top five. So there were nine product engineering teams at Meetup. And every Monday, all the teams had to say one feature they would ship by Friday. The lead team chose five of those teams. Those features became the top five. And if those five teams did not launch by Friday, they were publicly shamed in front of the whole company. So Meetup was effectively running a weekly fire drill. Those poor teams, they never got a chance to take a step back to look at tech debt, to look at bugs. And bear in mind that some teams had multiple top fives in a row. So Meetup had a safety problem. The first thing you do with a safety problem is you remove it. So we entered the top five. We shifted instead to OKRs, which had already existed, but the top five kind of superseded them. And because I'm a big believer in like you get what you measure, one of our new OKRs was about number of bugs in production. Not all of them, but uh, critical, major, and important. Because something is important, we really have to fix it. It turned out that teams cared hugely about quality, but they never had a chance to look at it because they were pushed so fast to push out new features to production. But now we set Kaizen's to improve it. Teams come up with a whole bunch of smart ideas for how to improve it, um, including introducing flow type, to React components, so introduced type safety, moved a whole bunch of really fun type bugs. But even after that, there were still a lot of incidents and outages in production. So I asked the engineers, tell me, how does on-call work at Meetup? And they told me, ah, well, there is one small team that is on-call for the code written by every other team. And this was done to protect feature teams. The idea being they wanted to encourage teams to ship new features. If a team is like dealing with production outages, they're not going to ship features. So we'll just we'll gather over here to that team over here. Um, it was intended to speed things up, but it had unintended side effects. It broke the virtuous alerting cycle. Like this is this is the virtuous alerting cycle. Um, something goes wrong. Uh, a team is alerted. Team fixes the issue. Hopefully, the team then takes a step back. They look at the quality and stability of their code in production. They make some improvements. They're alerted less. Yay. Meetup broke this cycle because the team that was pushing out new features to production was not the team that felt the pain when something that went wrong. So team two that's pushing new features, um, they're not incentivized to improve the quality and stability of their systems, because if team one is alerted at two in the morning when something goes wrong, eh. you might ask, uh, why did team one not spend their time improving the quality and stability of the systems? Well, bear in mind, they weren't just on call for the code of team two, but eight other teams. They don't have the time to do it. So the fix for this was to put all engineers on call. So every team is now on call for the systems that they own, and teams are directly incentivized to improve the quality and stability of their code in production. Hooray. So now, finally, uh, we had bugs and incidents under control. We turn our attention to cycle time. Again, team set Kaizen's with a whole bunch of smart ideas for different ways that they could get cycle time down. Uh, cycle time was actually 30 days when I got to Meetup. And bear in mind that this is an environment of continuous deployment. So every time an engineer checked in their code to master, it went live immediately. But still, 30 days to get one story all, all the way to the production. A whole bunch of interesting reasons why. One of them would be that, ooh, the thing that Meetup called stories, I would call epics. Those things were way too big. And the other problem was the way that stories were divided up. So in order to ensure that engineers would follow the architectural standards of Meetup, 
uh, what happened was that senior engineers would look at a story, decide what the implementation should be, break it into subtasks, and then assign those subtasks out to different engineers. Number of problems with that. Uh, number one, put your hands up if you love being given a solution, not a problem. Nobody? No, it's kind of demotivational. Every engineer was handed implementation and told to get it done. They were frustrated. They, were, they felt like they weren't learning new things. Plus, also, every engineer is given a small piece of the puzzle, but they're only focused on getting the implementation right. They're not really focused on solving the end problem for the user. Maybe there was a better solution, um, something that would have been smaller, but actually solved the problem, but no one could really think about it because they weren't given that to solve. So, uh, the fix for this was to end subtasks. I waged war on subtasks, and I said that uh, every engineer who picked up a story should decide on the implementation and how they want to solve it. And sure, if it's big or complicated, they should get architecture review from someone else, but they should be the ones who decide initially like what the solution should be. So, end result I've made up. This is after about a, a year and a half. Uh, cycle time went down from 30 days to five days. The number of bugs that were critical, major, or important in production, including production fires, went down from over 100 when I got there to less than 10. Uh, time on call <laughs> went down. The time people were paged when they went on call went down. And uh, mean time to resolution went down as well. The work to improve meetup continues. Sadly, I'm not there anymore, but some very lovely people are. So, in conclusion, the next time someone comes to tell you and says, how do we instill a sense of urgency under the team? Here are a few things to look out for. First of all, I'm a big believer that you get what you measure, so think hard about your incentives and your penalties. I always like to ask myself, what is the worst way someone could interpret something? Think of something like the top five. If, if you are going to shame people for not getting something done without any kind of balancing metric, like number of bugs, ooh, that leads to interesting problems. Safety is hugely motivational, but usually in the opposite way that you want. So what happens when something goes wrong? Do you blame people? Do you blame teams? Do you have a skills matrix? Is it clear what it means to do a role well? Is the path to promotion clear? Do your seniors mentor your juniors? Do you give teams problems, not solutions? Do teams have clear direction but autonomy in how to get there? And do your teams have operational ownership over their code? Do your teams know why? what they're working on is important. Can all teams draw a straight line from their stories to the company's strategy? If you have any questions, I am doing office hours at 6 p.m. Come find me. Thank you.